Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 821. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today is September 12, 2023. All right, welcome to another episode of Anglican Unscripted. We're glad you could join us. As you can tell by my background, I'm not in an RV. I'm not in a hotel room. I'm actually in a cafe here at the hotel, and uh, nobody's down here right now to bother us. So I'm going to record a show quickly. George, George, you look like you're held up in a in a, a cave somewhere. What's going on? I am at the house because the bug man is going through the parish hall and the, uh, my office today. Mm-hmm. We have what we politely call palmetto bugs, <laughs> oh, yeah, which right. you and I know as cockroaches. <laughs> and uh, with the with the well, it's not unusual, and it's not a sign of dirt or anything. It's rather uh, when the wet season comes, the bugs get driven inside into buildings from the ground outside, and yeah. this is when the you have that sort in your in the back of your mouth. You have that me- metallic tang <laughs> from all the pesticides that are being spread, either by you know you see the airplanes from the mosquito control district overhead spraying the county, and yeah. the bug man is uh, killing roaches and other bugs and, and whatnot. Well, but, a lot of people don't understand the the biggest challenge to living in Florida is not having AC. AC is wonderful and it makes it more comfortable. The biggest challenge is the insects and reptiles that uh, uh, so enjoy uh, that type of environment. And yeah, even in my RV, we have to, to, to spray the, the cement pad around the wheels to keep the bugs from getting in. And we've been very successful, but we had an invasion when we went through Kentucky two years ago called stink bugs. Mm-hmm. And they invaded in the uh, the RV, and it was so bad that we had to get rid of that RV. It was a complete infestation, and there was just nothing you could do about it. They were everywhere, and so now we spray, George. We had no idea. We have we have we have no problem with rodents, though. And the reason why is we're fortunate because we have several snakes that live in the bushes around our yeah. church, and I see one of them is a long black racer. He's about four feet long. He'll sun himself, and I can see him out the window. They're not poisonous or anything. They just uh, keep the uh, rodent population down. They do a good job. Hmm. So today is September 12th. On July 12th, You don't have any events on your calendar for today. Yeah, well, I do. (laughs) (laughs) Today is September 12th. Uh, On July 12th of this year, uh, Sasquatch, our home, broke down on the way from Rapid City to my dad's funeral in Minneapolis, and we took it to Floyd Struck Center. Today, Floyd Struck Center is finally fixing it. And so we are have you know, sometime about 3 o'clock, I'll get a phone call say, come pick her up. So it, it, it's a good day, but how many months is that? July, August, September? That's, that's two or three months. It's just been downtime that we've been doing hotels and friends and and uh, it, it, we've been so humbled by the, the generosity of people putting this up while uh, Sasquatch has been getting fixed. Kevin, why does it take so long to fix an RV? It doesn't. It takes a long time to find a single part, which they don't manufacture anymore. <laughs> that's, that's very frustrating, but it's COVID times, George. Uh, we, was it, you even had to buy a used part, didn't you? Or was yeah, you they, find they, a new they, one? We have a Freightliner chassis. Freightliner is the number one chassis maker in all the world. Uh, but at, on this older vehicle, 2007, they don't make the steering knuckle anymore. And the steering knuckle is what broke. And so we had to, I found but right Kevin, away. steering knuckles don't break. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so on July 15th, I found a steering knuckle a long time ago at a, a salvage yard. And they said, I said, you have my exact RV there. Can you go out and uh, weld off this uh, salvage knuckle and send it to me? Uh, we don't have that. No, you have it. <laughs> but they, they just don't want to do it. And so I finally had to get uh, an advocate 
uh, through uh, the truck center that we're working with, and he was on the phone with them for three days, finally convinced them to do it. Um, they, they, they're charging me a lot to do it, but we have a solution, and we're back on the road this week. Yay! Kevin, you're so patient. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so uh, it, it's a first world problem. That's why we haven't told you a lot about it. You know, uh, All I need to do is come on Anglican Scripted and complain that my RV won't work. You know, they, so, George, uh, um, you're getting your bug work done. Let's talk about news. People are kind of tired of us just talking about uh, our lives. That's kind of, we're, what, 10 minutes in the show? Let's talk about the news. It's been a bad week for the Free Church of England. We've been talking about them now for three weeks. Uh, first, we had a celibate, non-celibate, really celibate uh, priest there. And uh, we found that out through his obituary. Now we find out there's more news. And why don't you bring us up to speed and Mark Spears and what Bishop Pontus told us. The Free Church of England is uh, is a seems to be a bitter place right now because on Facebook and social media there are people within the Free Church of England attacking other people in the Free Church of yeah. England more than just your local jealousies and uh, annoyances. There's a priest named Mark Spears who has been accused on social media of uh, living with, cohabiting with a woman who is not his wife. And the Free Church of England formally does not really condone divorce and remarriage. And I don't know the detailed details, but the, uh, the accusations were spread all over social media. And I had several Free Church of England ministers send me pic snapshots of the Twitter exchanges. And so I wrote to Bishop Paul Hunt asking for clarification and Bishop Hunt, and we didn't do this story last week because we were waiting upon Bishop Hunt to respond. That's right, yeah. He has decided not to respond, and so basically we leave it out there. So the allegations of adultery have not been uh, explained nor dismissed. So the story so much isn't about an individual's marital arrangements. The Free Church of England has its canons and <clears throat> the question is, are they being followed or not? But the deeper question is, the Free Church of England, which is a member of GAFCON, seems to be in a place of very heightened uh, tension within its own life, so that uh, uh, people are reaching out. Uh, some, we have to be careful, Kevin, because sometimes people use us as clubs to beat other people with. Um, yeah, that, that's very true. And we know the people in charge of the Free Church of England. Um, they're wonderful people. Uh, and so we, we want to tread lightly here. But just imagine this news coming from the Anglican Church in Canada. It's not a news story. Imagine this coming from the Episcopal Church. Any diocese uh, except one or two in the Episcopal Church, this is a non-news story. Uh, if this were the Church of England, it's a non-news story. Here in, in a GAFCON province, it's a, it's a little bit of news, George. And so, so I need to ask myself, uh, what spiritually, it, we're, we're, we see the Free Church of England engaged in some form of spiritual warfare. Could it be that the, the direction of this Free Church of England is just like the Reformed Episcopal Church went from being ultra-Protestant to its... Uh, its current leadership is um, essentially Anglo-Catholic, and we've seen that switch over a generation. <coughs> is the Free Church of England following that trajectory? Calvin Robinson, who is probably the most famous Free Church of England minister that uh, the average person would be aware of, is rather Anglo-Catholic, and yet the Free Church of England is supposed to be the Protestant, Protestant wing. Mm -hmm. And what's going on? I don't know the answer to that, but there is a degree of confusion, a lack of uh, Episcopal leadership. And you know, so at the end of the day, this story isn't about the individual who may or may not be living with a woman, not his wife. It's rather that this component within GAFCON is going through some sort of chrysalis and will be interesting to see what it comes out at the end looking on well i mean part of the show is about accountability 
you know, what failed in the Episcopal Church and uh, largely the Anglican Church in the Western culture is its lack of accountability. It won't hold its uh, uh, bishops accountable, its archbishops accountable. Uh, we would hope that we could find, at least in the Afghan province, some accountability at the, 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 the priest level, the clergy level there. So I don't know. We'll have to see how it works. Now, do understand I'm in a cafe, so you're going to hear a little... Somebody's cleaning up a counter over there. And because I'm in Wisconsin, there's Wisconsin nice going on. So every time somebody walks in front of my, my uh, field of view here, they wave. And as a Wisconsinite, you're required by law to wave back and make eye contact. I, 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 just let you know that this is a, an open studio and George is still in his cave. So let's move on to some more news here. Um, prosecution versus persecution. Uh, the Finnish are trying to combine both the trial of former Finnish government minister uh, Pave Rasani and Bishop... Kevin, you, you, your, fam <laughs> your genes are from that part of the world. You should have a better job than I do. <laughs> no idea here. Uh, no, no, I'm from Wisconsin. I can do Johnson, Smith, Brown. I can do lots of good uh, Midwest uh, last names. But two individuals in uh, Finland are being persecuted and prosecuted at the same time, George. What's the, what's the story there? This has been a long-running story. It's a woman, Pavi Rasanen, who is a former Finnish uh, government minister. She's a politician. She's a evangelical Christian, and she's a member of the Evangelical Lutheran Missionary Diocese of Finland, which is the Finnish ACNA. And it's led by Bishop Johanna or Johan Pajola. Mm -hmm. They, uh, in uh, tw 2004, uh, she wrote a pamphlet citing Paul's letter to the Romans saying homosexuality is not God's plan for people. She's tweeted this, and in 2019, she gave a radio interview where she restated her views on homosexuality. And the bishop was the co-author of the 2004 pamphlet. Finland has hate speech laws uh, where you may not... Uh, uh, commit agitation against a minority group. And the prosecutor in Helsinki uh, brought hate speech case against the two people. And he lost. Well, Finland allows the prosecutor to appeal a loss at the local court. And the prosecutor has filed his appeal and basically the courts of appeal are rehearing this case and the prosecutor is seeking to punish this politician and this bishop for publicly uh, publicly affirming Paul's passage in Romans about those who shall not inherit the kingdom of God, include those who commit uh, homosexual acts. He wants them to be punished for denigrating the appealing, uh, the feelings of uh, gays and lesbians in Finland. Now, so Chip Roy, who's a Texas congressman, and about 14 other congressmen have signed a letter to the State Department saying, you need to give Finland a good kick because they want to join NATO. Then they uh, are want, to, you know, how can we be in favor of this country that is persecuting Christians through hate speech laws? Mm -hmm. So this is, not, this is a local case, but it also has major ramifications for free speech in Europe. And if we let the Finns get away with this, uh, where does it stop, so to speak, is the thinking? Oh, I, I don't know what you're talking George, we do this in Virginia. In Virginia, um, a, a schoolgirl was assaulted in the bathroom by a transgendered boy. Uh, well, if you're trying to a girl, whatever. He's, he was a boy who wanted, who pretended to be a girl. He was in the bathroom and sexually assaulted this girl. The father goes to the school board and complains. The father is arrested. The father uh, goes to jail. The father is finally pardoned by the governor of Virginia uh, yesterday. And we're, we're prosecuting and persecuting Christians here too. Yeah. No, Kevin, I don't want to say we. Uh, I don't want to say we. American officials are, mm -hmm. but the, okay, I'll say it. This is demonic. This whole transgender business. Yes, yes, there is that one in a million person who is 
born with genetic birth defects that they're neither this nor that. That's 0.018%. And yes, there are people with a mental illness called gender dysphoria, where they have a severe mental illness akin to anorexia, akin to other things that uh, Bef- bef- afflicts them. Before the invention of the iPhone, that was less than 1% of the populace. And, but what we have now is a social contagion of demonic origin where we have these people identifying uh, as the opposite gender or sex. Um, I saw something from the Diocese of California, which is the Episcopal Diocese out of San Francisco, which strikes me as demonic, and I use that word on purpose. A volunteer with Kairos, which is the non-denominational prison ministry. I'm involved in Kairos here. Uh, On November uh, 15th, we have a Kairos weekend at Sumter Correctional Institute, pretty close to where you live. it is a wonderful, life-changing ministry where a team of people go into a men's prison or a women's prison and spend Thursday through Sunday almost like a Crucio in prison. I cannot highly recommend it enough. You go home at night. You don't stay in the prison overnight. But you're there from like 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Well, in the Diocese of California, a Kairos volunteer was... Uh, angered, an Episcopalian was angered to learn that uh, transgender volunteers cannot go into uh, California prisons under the Kairos banner. So if you're a man who thinks they're a woman, you cannot join a women's Kairos team. So the Diocese of California is getting itself worked up and is basically going to bring to the next general convention a resolution denouncing Kairos for transphobia. And we should not in any way be involved with prison ministry until we affirm the right of transgender people to serve on Kairos teams for any gender. Which speaks to me both of the spiritual immaturity of the people in California, the the Episcopal Diocese there, that they think it's all about me. One second. Are you going to vacuum here? Uh, okay, yeah, in about half hour. Okay. Oh, now they want to vacuum, but she's going to come back in half an hour. Okay, go. It speaks to me the spiritual maturity of the people at the Diocese of California that they think it's all about them until things are done their way. And in Kairos, you're with Catholics, Protestants, non denomination, you're with the whole gamut of people. You're with, and, but they have to conform to. The Diocese of California wants to do cancel culture on Kairos over transgenderism. This stuff is evil and sick, Kevin. It's 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 straight out of Paul's letter to the Romans. Uh, uh. Well, no, it, this is the spirit of the age, and uh, certainly this you know was spoken of uh, as something that it could occur where. Uh, we would lead to our own destruction. And we're doing it so quickly. We're going to lose a whole culture, uh, a whole generation, uh, to a generation me, a generation, I, I call it the generation cosplay, uh, where they're, they're, they're living this fantasy. And uh, to oppose them is to go to jail. To oppose them is to be canceled. To oppose them is to be persecuted and prosecuted. Never has such a small minority had such a loud voice and so much power, and it leads to our destruction. We, we can't allow this, and we are now afraid as a church, and as a culture, and as a people to say no. Yeah. So, let's move on to our next story real quick here. Um, do 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 do. Evangelical appointed bishop of Birmingham, uh, <laughs> let the war begin. Michael Volland is the Dean of Ridley Hall, which is an evangelical theological college in Cambridge, England. And that that albino rhino, that uh, black swan event has occurred where a decent bishop has been appointed to a diocesan post, not an assistant post, but a diocesan bishop. And 
as the sun rises in the morning, so the liberal whining has begun. Michael Volland is being attacked by gay and uh, lesbian clergy in the Diocese of Birmingham, saying he cannot be bishop for all of us. Therefore, he should be refused by the chapter uh, when they formally... In other words, all the crapola that was done to Philip North when he was uh, first time up to be a diocesan bishop, because Philip North is an Anglo-Catholic, uh, he can't be a bishop for all of us. Never mind a liberal company man can't be a bishop for all of us. That doesn't matter. All of us only applies to the perpetually outraged. So we'll see if Michael Volan succumbs to the pressure uh, of the chorus of, uh, of name-calling or whether he... Uh, to accept the purple shirt in Birmingham, he decides to modify his views. So we'll see how this unfolds. Um, it's going to be a tough time for Michael Vollin, and we need to pray for him. No, we need both to for his personal safety and integrity. I'm only really here to back up and and give him the words he needs to become bishop. Uh, abortion is a blessing. That'll get you uh, a solid bishopship in. Uh, in the Church of England. Um, what else can we do here? Uh, oh, I woke up this morning, and for a couple hours, I thought I was a woman, so I dressed up as a woman. That'll get you a, a solid bishopship there. Yeah, there's, there's lots of things he could do to, to bridge that gap, George, between himself and the liberals. Well, yeah. good news that somebody <laughs> has arisen through the muck but let's just see whether he's neutered in the process or whether he thrives. All right, some very sad news. There was a fire in Johannesburg in the slums, and uh, this is indicative of what's happening and going to happen in a country that has lost itself. I, I don't know if America is headed this way, but uh, South Africa has fully arrived there, George. Well, California is heading this way, yeah. uh, where zoning laws only apply to certain people. A, uh, a, a, bill, uh, a downtown building in Johannesburg, uh, which, is, uh, which was once a thriving Western mm -hmm. city, it now has abandoned buildings. It's turning into a Detroit, so to speak. A building caught fire, and 74 squatters died in the fire. An equal number were injured. And they shouldn't have been in the building in the first place. Uh, you know, when you set up little campfires in a former office building and it catches on fire. And this is, uh, there are some parts of Durban, of Johannesburg, of Victoria, where the, the, the African National Congress government just doesn't enforce zoning laws so that you've got... Uh, squatters taking over a building that is not fit for human habitation and so when they do catch on fire there's the beating of the breasts oh we'll do better but when the rule of law becomes politicized when it's you know the rules apply to these people but not to those people when uh, you go to california and california has some of the harshest zoning laws that you'll ever see in the united states if you're a homeowner in suburban, Cal in suburban California and you want to take a tree down or you want to do some sort of building, you've got years of paperwork and government forms to fill out and this and that. I'm exaggerating, of course, in years, but you've got to hoops to jump through. Yeah. If, if you want to, however, if you want to stick 75 illegal aliens uh, or migrant workers in a house designed with two bedrooms and one bath, nobody will stop you. If you want to, if if you don't maintain your lawn properly in area A, the county will beat you up. If you want to j throw your garbage and trash and just live like you're in rural Mexico, but you're in the San Joaquin Valley, no problem. The rules are not evenly enforced. They're enforced against the middle class who are being asked to pay for all this, while uh, new Californians are. Uh, basically allowed to import the ways from their former countries. And instead of their assimilating and moving up, they're pulling California and other parts of the country down. 
Yeah. You see this. You see this in Manhattan, where liberal Manhattan and the ladies on the View, which is I've never actually seen it myself, but it's this morning no talk show <laughs> with uh, Whoopi Goldberg and company. I think she's, is, she, is she still on it? I thought she was off it. I, I don't know, know what you. Yeah. I, yeah. Well, the ladies of the View, and I use the ladies in a uh, polite term, not in a descriptive term. Um, are now upset about all the illegal aliens in Manhattan because it's making the city unlivable because you can't eat lunch anymore at a sidewalk cafe um, because of the the police no longer enforce because the politicians tell the police no longer enforce the laws about broken windows and panhandling and squeegee men and so Manhattan's gone back to the bad old days of the 1970s for those who remember that um, San Francisco is becoming the next Detroit and we have uh, this happening in uh, Johannesburg and other parts of the world as well the, the world seems to be moving backwards we're de we're going through a de-civilization and the Archbishop of Cape Town of course gave a speech about this tragedy but where's the Archbishop of Cape Town he's not on the side of you know clean up and good government he's on the side of you know well we need to do more for the vagrants and the homeless and this and that. Well, well, yeah. which is true I mean that is the side we want to be on as Christians to do more but we need to do more safely and mm -hmm. doing more is not opening up empty office buildings doing more is uh, setting up uh, places where we can re-invite these people into our civilization uh, to, to provide uh, ministries for uh, mental health, ministries to help feed and clothe and, and you know, reinvigorate what it means to be alive. Uh, if you just put them in an empty office building, you're, you're saying, we don't care, we forgot you, just like we forgot the business that used to be here. We, you, know? you, and I, you and I, Kevin, are so lucky that our, that our children live in the United States right now because mm -hmm. they will be, a, your daughter, uh, Michaela, bought a house, didn't she, mm -hmm. recently? Hmm? She, how old is she now? 23, 20? Okay, I'm going to age myself, but I think she just turned 26. Uh, 26? Yeah. Well, Michaela could buy a house with she and her husband's middle class income mm -hmm. in Pittsburgh, and it's it's not 500 miles away in the mountains or in a dump or whatever. She could buy a normal, nice house, mm -hmm. but that option is not available to the young people in England. The housing, the housing crisis is so horrible that uh, to buy a house is just out of the realm of possibility. Um, and that's where we're moving as a society for some reason. I don't understand it. Yeah, I'm, middle class affordability, and this is economics, this is not an economic show. Uh, understand that you know uh, I made money because I'm a, an entrepreneur. George actually had his first job in Wall Street. Uh, we uh, and lost money. Yeah, <laughs> lost money, and so we we have a little bit of economics in our parlance. But, you but know. this is a spirit. But this is a spiritual crisis as it well is, because yeah. it speaks to a hopelessness that mm -hmm. it's all tied into. Uh, the rise of such things as the transgender movement and the, you know, all of this and that. It's all of one piece. It's just all coming out in different directions. It is. I mean, the biggest failure we have right now in America is called cashless bail, where you can commit a crime and they will book you and you make bail by just signing an agreement and you're released. Uh, there's a person who beat somebody senseless on a New York City, uh, New York subway system uh, two weeks ago. You know, this person's completely bloodied. Uh, they arraign the guy, they bring him in, they charge him, and they release him, the, the person who did this. And because we have cashless bail, it was a felony. No felony should, you know, a, a violent felon should be let out again uh, hours after he's, he's arrested. And we see that in San Francisco, Chicago, Seattle, um, Philadelphia. New York City, Philadelphia, um, and that is going to, that's not holding a person accountable. He can go out and recommit the crime. We have mobs of people now in America who will go to a store and take all the merchandise out in one flash robbery. Uh, it happens at high-end purse stores where I've never been, but, uh, you know, it's, 
this is the spirit of the age is we, we don't prosecute people because um, they obviously need it more than we do. You know, all things being equal, the people who are stealing uh, have been put down by our society, and uh, this is the only way they know how to, to reach out and react. And that's the end of the. That's the end of West, Western civilization, right there, George. That's the end. And that and that anger is brought into the church. In other words, I see that in. It's not that I have these mobs of people who are ransacking Gucci stores, attending church, mm -hmm. but rather the the people uh, in the congregation, in the pews, have an anger about the world around them. This is not how life should be. Uh, we don't have any Gucci stores here. In fact, we're really excited because they're going to build the first Target in the county. We're getting a Target store, which people now want to boycott before it's even built. That's a different story. Uh, <laughs> but the the sense of societal unease hasn't, I haven't noticed this since I was a teenager in the 70s. I, I would say it's that bad. Yeah, it, it is. I mean, here, I'm going to show you a quick little picture here. Um, this, yeah, I forget what her uh, job title is. Uh, she is a uh, politician in Minneapolis. And she was really on the, uh, this is where George Floyd was uh, uh, killed. And right away, uh, I can't pronounce her name, said, we're going to dismantle the Minneapolis police. This is right after the George Floyd riot, riots. Say it with me, say it with me. Dismantle the Minneapolis Police Department. Blah, 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 blah. Oh, guess what? <laughs> she was mugged uh, and had her car stolen last week. Now guess what side of the, uh, the equation she's at? She now thinks that uh, we need to fully uh, engage and, and hire more police officers. Uh, I guess the saying is every new conservative is a mugged liberal. Um, and this is what's happening is uh, there's consequences for not enforcing laws. There's consequences. Look at the Episcopal Church. There's consequences for not having accountability enforced. Mm -hmm. uh, when uh, we were not able to uh, uh, to pose a certain bishop back in the late 70s for what he was doing, uh, a Bishop Spong and a, and a writer, uh, this is what happened. You've lost the Episcopal Church. We are not able to arrest people on the streets for crime. We are going to lose uh, our cities, and we, we are losing them left and right. Uh, I would say the biggest loss right now is probably San Francisco because they look at what's happening on the streets and they still don't do anything. They mm -hmm. still they think there's a problem, they don't think the problem is them. George, let's move on to the news. Uh, we had a couple people fired this week or stepped down or resigned in the Episcopal Church. Remarkable. Yep. We reported last week about how Prince Singh, the Bishop of Eastern and Western Michigan, he holds uh, two half jobs to make a full-time job, uh, was uh, stood down from ministry because of allegations that uh, by his ex-wife that he had been uh, abusive. Well, Bishop Singh has since resigned and he's taken himself out of the picture. Um, we talked about the uh, this being uh, the Me Too movement uh, is now hitting the Episcopal Church. Um, we also spoke last week about the Bishop of Oklahoma and Interestingly enough, we had a number of people saying, I knew this guy, Ed, Ed Kanishi, when he was a parish priest in Oklahoma, in Colorado, and boy, uh, what goes around comes around. Uh, I cannot verify this, but uh, allegedly, I, did allegedly. Not get, I did not get anybody <laughs> saying that, oh, isn't this terrible, this poor fellow. I got these emails from people who know Ed personally who was saying, how this guy who was such a bully ever became a bishop, I don't know. And now that he's in his power has been weakened by another rising political star, she in essence is, well, to play pure power politics, she is slaying uh, her mentor mm -hmm. and assuming all power. So it just is not the... Uh, 
Well, maybe human nature doesn't really change that much, and putting on a purple shirt doesn't make you a better person. You say human nature, I say sinful nature. Yeah, yeah, just changing the words around. Uh, you post a story about a priest who was fired as well in Maryland. They uh, fired a priest. He uh, was, He's in Western Maryland, near Frederick, Maryland. Uh, in the 70s, when he was a Roman Catholic layperson, he was a, he was a uh, Boy Scout leader or some sort of youth camp follower. He uh, allegedly tried to molest some uh, scouts at a Catholic summer camp. Uh, years go by, he decides to become an Episcopal priest and is an Episcopal priest and is now in Western Maryland. And the Catholic Church, because of an attorney general investigation in Maryland, releases the names of all those who are accused of abuse. And now the Catholic Church is abusing them, uh, in investigating those, and as is our, the attorney general's office. And so this priest was brought into the office of the uh, Gene Sutton, the bishop of Episcopal Bishop of Maryland, and said, "What is this story from 50 years ago?" And the priest says, "Bye bye, I'm out." <laughs> well, okay, <laughs> I'm gone. You got me. Uh, you got me. Yeah. Well, I mean, he said, I, "We don't need to investigate this further. I'm stepping down." You know, so. Yeah. But, but, you know, this is one of the things in the bad old days when there wasn't good communications, we had people from the Catholic Church joining the Episcopal Church and peop and the Catholic Church wouldn't talk to the Episcopal no. Church about their past. And so we got a few people who were fleeing the Catholic Church ahead of charges of abuse who were received as uh, and became Episcopal priests who had been Catholic, uh, m uh, religious, or uh, diocesan priests. Now, that doesn't happen anymore, but in the old days when we didn't talk to each other and when abuse was something that other people did, it happened in other churches. You, you say the good old days. I remember a recent case where uh, the honorable, wonderful, uh, greatest priestess ever, Catherine Jeffrey Shorey, uh, had higher, uh, an interaction with an individual who used to be Roman Catholic and was working in one of her churches and was accused of this and she just let it go. Is that my memory correct? Do you remember that story? Oh, Kevin, that was a wonderful story. Uh, <laughs> I mean, you, you say long ago. I'm like, that's that's a decade ago. This Catholic brother mm -hmm. uh, who is also a, an ordained priest in mm -hmm. South Dakota, I believe, was put on leave of absence and suspended and investigated for child abuse by the Catholic Church. He basically resigned his orders and moved to Las Vegas, where he became the organist at a church. And well, Los, uh, Nevada is a tiny diocese and it always needs clergy. And about after a year or two, he approached Catherine Jeffrey Shorey and said, hey, I'd be happy to be a priest. I'm a former Catholic priest. And she said, fine, wonderful, welcome on board. And the guy became an Episcopal priest. And later, uh, some this all sort of blew up and i asked the diocese uh at this time catherine jeffrey shore was the presiding bishop i said do you have you know what's the deal with this guy and the diocese responded well his file is missing so in other words somebody pulled his file to show that no, in other words you're supposed to do due diligence and just take anybody who walks off the street. She may have had a copy of his ordination certificate, but she didn't ask the bishop, the South Dakota, I think it was South Dakota, she didn't ask the Midwest somewhere, might yeah. have been Minnesota, St. John's uh, in Minnesota, someplace upper mid, upper Midwest. <laughs> it's a big country here, okay. <laughs> she she asked, she she obviously, I we can infer from the missing documents, did not do due diligence and received into the Episcopal Church somebody who had been kicked out of the Catholic Church. Uh, that was a great story, and of course, the the National Church. Uh, that was one of the ones where they just wouldn't answer. No, yeah. that they wouldn't an answer what university she was a dean of. I mean, there's a lots of you know fun stories we had with a uh, uh, Catherine Jeffrey Shorey, who now in my deepest heart I do miss her at, in leadership because uh, it it was. Uh, 
it was a surprise every week, George. It, it made you mm-hmm. and I famous, if not just a little bit of infamy. We got a couple more stories here to finish up with. And one of the, the biggest stories we find with the launch of GAFCON uh, and the, the remaining Episcopal Church and the remaining uh, Ch- Anglican Church of Canada and uh, Ch- Church of England is kind of a contrast. It's a tale of two churches, really. When I look at uh, a GAFCON province and I, I see the state of the church uh, sermon given by, you know, an Archbishop Foley Beach or uh, the Archbishop of Nigeria or Uganda, I'm like, yeah, they know what's going on here. They're going to go c- uh, continue to take the world for Christ. And then we will see something from the Episcopal Church where we have decided not to go to the city of uh, Cleveland for our next uh, uh, General Synod Council because they don't have strong enough union rules. And I'm like, oh, okay, uh, that's different. You posted uh, here, we need to talk about a tale of the Church of Wales versus the, the Church of Fifty. And you're making some good points here. This is the tale of two churches. September 5th, the governing body of the Church in Wales met, which is their synod. Mm-hmm. And in his presidential address, Archbishop Andy John spoke about what was central to the work and mission of the Church in Wales at this stage in his life. And I'll have to quote some of the key sentences here. The Church in Wales has the opportunity to redesign our approach to energy, water, land use, and the sustainability of food supply and at a local level. Mm. In other words, Andy John is the is the Green Archbishop. The Church in Wales is going to make sure all of its buildings are net zero carbon. Well, one way you do that is to close them so that people don't mess things up. Yeah. But the the greatest challenge is finding a common language and agree broad principles that allow policies and direction to emerge on the environment. This is the message and meaning of the Church in Wales governing body. Now contrast that to the opening of the Sydney Synod yesterday, September 11th. In his presidential address, Kanishka Raphael, the Archbishop of Sydney, and bear in mind the Diocese of Sydney is about the size of the entire Church in Wales. Mm -hmm. Kanishka Raphael starts off by saying, I bring before Synod a statement of purpose and priorities for our diocesan fellowship. Now, is this going to be green energy? Is this going to be mosquito nets? No, he said, under God, we seek to to see God multiply believers in Christ, multiply churches, multiply workers for the harvest field. We need the work of God in us so that we long for the welfare of our neighbors and friends and fellow Sydney siders with a longing of Jesus who wept over Jerusalem though it was hardened against him. So is this Kanishka Raphael absolutely saying the environment? Forget that, no. He's saying we want to work for the welfare of our brothers and sisters in Sydney, but we do so by seeking God's multiplication of believers of multiplying churches, of raising up more workers, of ministers, of mission workers. This is two different, this is two different faiths, really, when you put the church in Wales next to the Diocese of Sydney. One sees its mission totally in secular terms. We've got all this inherited money, nobody's listening to our message, therefore let's redesign ourselves and become something new. Whereas the Diocese of Sydney saying, okay, even just as Jesus wept over Jerusalem because Jerusalem was hard against us, most Sydney siders, especially the media, think that we are cruel and cranky because we're not into all the latest social fads, transgenderism, homosexuality, this and that. But our job is to build the kingdom of Christ and we long for the welfare of our neighbors and friends to be multiplied and made complete, but through Jesus Christ. The you church see of, the difference yeah. there, Kevin? It's just yeah. so, it, it, you can't make it any more transparent than that. The Church of Wales has made itself a carbon copy of its culture. 
mm-hmm. and said, "This is our this is our way forward. This is our future, and this is how we will grow." The the di- the, the Church of Sydney, Diocese of Sydney, has decided that Sydney itself will be a carbon copy of the Diocese of Sydney. Said we're going out there and and make sure that that the world knows who we are as Christians. The world knows who we are as Christians because Christ is alive and he's real and he can work within Australia to build these churches and to bring people to Christ and to grow new relationships. The Church of Wales is fine, just fine with old relationships. You know, just fine. Thank you so much. So that, that is a great contrast, George. I'm glad, glad, uh, glad you brought that up. Um... News, not news, Bishop of Woolwich dies. Uh, he was a kind of a transplant, right? He was a Norwegian. Uh, Caraway Dorgu mm-hmm. was Bishop of Woolwich. And there's a great deal of uh, weeping and gnashing of teeth from official quarters in England. And it is sad, a 65-year-old man with the family died. Yeah. And we wish his, we wish peace and strength to his family. But... There is also a sense of people who are protesting a bit much. This is a case of, uh, of a Nigerian cleric who moved to the UK and drank the Kool-Aid. And in other words, he was billed as being an evangelical. He was billed as sort of being the one who would speak for the conservative, Bible-believing Christians. And when these issues arose, when it was time to be called upon, he always fell short. Um, an example. The diocesan director of ordinance in Southwark, which is the diocese of where he was an area bishop in Woolwich, is a woman and she's a lesbian and she had her wedding at the cathedral and then her reception at the cathedral. Gay wedding. Uh, And the evangelical fellowship in Southwark approached the bishop uh, Dorgu, who is supposed to be, if you will, their man, said, we're having, we can't do this. This is wrong. And the bishop basically said, uh, I won't use... The no, you can use the first uh, two letters, the F and U, go together, and they yes. can, they'll figure it out. Yeah. yeah. It, and so it was quite apparent from the very beginning that this fellow was another African on the make. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have plenty of those in the Episcopal Church, people who to dawn the purple will jump their uh, principles. Hold on. Uh, now, to be fair, they're just a small fraction of the whites who are on the take. <laughs> okay, I mean, <laughs> our next story is going to be a, a, about on the take uh, in the Episcopal Church, but uh, I, I don't want to say that we're pointing out just one uh, color here or one culture. Everybody in the Episcopal Church, except very few, are on the take. Hmm. So, on to our next story, George. Uh, a very disappointing cho- uh, story for both of us. Uh, Jeremiah Williamson has been elected Bishop of Albany on the fourth round. He's the Rector of Grace St. Stephen's in Colorado Springs. And we should talk about this because Albany, up until a year ago, was one of the conservative bastions left in the Episcopal Church. Uh, you and I can probably just name a couple of dioceses that still uh, hold the, the the remnant faith for the Episcopal Church. Albany was one of them. Uh, bishop Love was its last uh, bishop. This is a change of events because Williams Williamson is uh, not conservative in the least bit. This has been very difficult for emotionally. Mm-hmm. Um, Jeremiah, uh, Jeremiah Williamson is liberal. He, in his essays uh, for, the con- for the diocese, said he has performed same-sex marriages. Mm-hmm. He's totally in favor of the Episcopal Church's view on human sexuality. Albany has always been strongly opposed, and this is what the National Church did to get rid of Bishop Love, to, to beat him. There were four candidates. Uh, three conservative and uh, Williamson. And Williamson is, I think he has alopecia. Is that the right way to describe it? He has no hair, no eyebrows, no eyelashes, no hair on his face. He has a rather lizard-like countenance um, with 
the drooping eyes and, and all that. <laughs> I don't mind that. <laughs> okay, well, he was elected on the fourth round by a vote of 56 to 54 in the clergy order. One priest switched their vote. And, he, and the other person was Scott Garno of St. Stephen's in Del Mar. And Scott Garno was conservative. He was opposed to gay marriage. He was the former president, maybe the, he was president of the standing committee. He was, Albany is always elected from within. Always, yes. Yeah. And the other two candidates dropped out after the second and third round, so making it a straight contest between Williamson and Garno. So while it was very close and Garno led amongst the clergy, Williamson from the very beginning had a strong margin among the laity so that the final vote of the fourth round was 56 to 54 in the clergy, but 65 to 22 in the laity. And one priest or one deacon basically has written the last word on the Diocese of Albany. After the vote, uh, why is this? Well, Albany is a poor diocese. Upstate New York is a poor region. Mm -hmm. It has suffered through uh, economic closures for a long time. New York is a very heavy tax state. Uh, as soon as people retire, they leave. Young people, when they finish high school, they don't stay in uh, in uh, Plattsburgh or uh, whatnot. They get on the bus, either go to the big city or they go to where the economy is thriving. A lot of little tiny churches. This and okay, I'll say. I've asked myself, Lord, I can think of a dozen elections where there was a good man and woman on the die ballot, and the wrong person, according to my likes, was elected. Here's the latest one. Um following Charlie Holt's loss, it, you know, the debacle in Florida and all this stuff. It's not that the liberals are just that well or organized because I know the Episcopal Church, it's chaos, it's continuous chaos. But the Holy Spirit seems to have withdrawn from the bishops, House of Bishops as a group in the Episcopal Church because a more unimpressive group of clergy, it's really hard to find. People who really have not achieved or accomplished anything as parish priests, some of them have never been parish priests or bishops now. People with no charisms of holiness, of no, there's no, you know, say what we like about Jack Spong being a heretic and a nut job. He had a bit of a charism of leadership around him. And he knew he was a heretic. Yeah, yeah, he knew. Yeah, he, I mean, but he, we we don't we we don't have anybody like that at all. The Episcopal bishops of the last generation are becoming like the Church of England bishops, mm -hmm. middle class managers, middle ranking managers, not men and women of God. And so I have to ask myself. Um, I mean, this has been going on for a very long time. Um, our former bishop in Central Florida, Greg Brewer, was not my choice. I had originally uh, asked Ephraim Radner from the University of Toronto to stand for election. Mm -hmm. He declined. He felt that he was called to stay in the ministry. And then we had internal candidates in Greg Brewer, and I voted for one of the internal candidates. Um, and Greg Brewer won. Well, we can make the best of it. He's not a bad guy. Yeah. He's, you know, in a but, world where there's evil bishops, Greg Brewer was not one of them. He was okay, yeah. but the point was there were other people on the candidate who were dynamic, who were, you know, would lead, take the battle to the enemy rather than just be defensive, who would stand for Christ. These guys and gals have not been elected. And what, and I'm think, and I've come to the point now that this is an act of the Holy Spirit here. They're still active in parish ministry. They're still active in the sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. And there are many, many excellent Episcopal parishes. Not uniformly. I'm not saying that. But there is something, and just as you can say in the Church of England, 
oh, my church, my parish is excellent, my minister is wonderful, we're doing okay, and everybody else is collapsing. I can say that, you know, about my church. And why is God allowing this to happen? Why is why are we going through this shakeout? What's going on here? And I don't know the answer to that. And I wish Jeremiah Williamson well. I mean, I don't know the man, but I just, you know, Scott Garneau would have fought the good fight, whereas Williamson is fully paid up on the other side. My problem is, in all this that we've witnessed in the last 20 years in the Episcopal Church, no diocese has come back. No diocese has gone the liberal route and at some point repented and brought in a conservative um, or middle bishop. Once they've gone down that road, they stay there. And uh, you see, you know, <laughs> prime example, Diocese of Connecticut, my former diocese. It, it is, you know, just a handful of people compared to what it used to be. They've had, you know, keep downsizing. Uh, their offices, if you look at their the Dyson website, is just full of social um, activities type people. That uh, uh, there's no ministry there for the gospel. If you go to the Diocese of, uh, uh, Diocese of Connecticut's website, every staff person has their pronoun listed. Oh boy, I hope that wins more people for Christ. Um, what we what we've arrived at here, especially with the Episcopal Church, and I'm looking from the outside, is in Revelation. We're called to make our yeses yes and our noes no. And what we're doing is elected people who say maybe all the time, or you know, we need to consider all sides, or all things being equal. Um, they don't make their yeses yes or their noes no, because they don't want to be locked down on one side. Now, when it comes to, to trans and the new identity cult, they're, a, they're, they're yes, because that's where the paycheck is. Um, and, and that's where they think the future of the church resides in a broken, you know. My, my prayer right now is for the 54 clergy who voted for Garno. And as they look to see what happens now, some of them, if they're young, can basically jump without any immediate consequences. What if you're my age, you're 60, and you've got a good parish and you're doing work that means changes people's lives. Is it worth wrecking that? Because it will wreck it because New York, New York is one of the states that ruled that the diocese keeps the property, not the congregation. It's not not Fort Worth right. or other place or Illinois. Um, why? And you're basically living hand to mouth anyway, and you've got an inherited building where half the people's grandparents are buried in the cemetery. So it's not like uh, Florida, where if you pick up and move, you're not leaving something behind. What do you do? Do you basically toe the line, mark the 10 years to your retirement, and devote your entire life, heart, and soul to the pastoral and spiritual well-being of this select group of people, where you're essentially a chaplaincy for this community? because you can no longer feel part of the this branch of the Catholic Church because it's no longer Catholic, no longer universal, no longer part of the... It, 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 it affirms and teaches things that are contrary to Scripture. Um, what do you do? And I, I've had to go through that. Fortunately, I've thought where I am, Central Florida, Dallas is the other big diocese that I can think of, like ours, that we haven't been forced to make that choice, but there will be men and women in Albany who may take early retirement and then join the ACNA, who may just fight it out for 10 years, who may leave now. And so what's going to happen, one of the reasons why the vote was so close is because so many clergy left after Bill Love resigned. It's, you know, we saw this going back to Colorado. Colorado once was a conservative diocese. Then you had the first AMIA defections. Yeah. And now it's got a black woman bishop who talks about their transgender child. You know, we've seen that in my lifetime because the conservatives vote with their feet and leave or they don't involve themselves and the liberals never retreat. 
they just if they uh, if they feel resistance they pause and wait for the next time to move forward yeah which is just the next bishop election you know it, yeah when a liberal is in leadership at the bishop level the damage they do so quickly uh mm -hmm. by causing clearly the conservatives to leave uh we should just do an expose once uh where you and i sit down and talk for 40 minutes about the diocese of colorado and what happened there uh that election was just a key turning point and the fleeing in the colorado happened within three three to six months uh, mm -hmm. after that election it was just completely different and so you know that's i don't know the long stance for uh, Albany, but you know who I pray for in Albany? The lost. The people who would go to a church uh, seeking transformation for the, the sins that they have and, and, and they're seeking Christ and are seeking a relationship with the Father and they don't find it in the church. And, you know, God is certainly amongst our nation and certainly in the Middle East causing young men to dream dreams and young women to dream dreams and, and to seek him out and the well, shame is they're not going to be able to find them in Albany at a, in an Episcopal church. Well, I, the, uh, well, they could find it in some Episcopal churches with some good clergy, but you, can't make, you cannot just assume when you walk into any church that you're going to get the sure. goods. Yeah. You've got to look hard. Now, the, the I'm fearful for the ACNA, frankly, because Foley Beach has got a year, and the two people touted to replace him. One's a good guy, the other's a buffoon. And uh, we're moving from that first generation, you know, the ACNA started with Bob Duncan and then moved to Foley Beach, a man of, if not equal, greater, uh, strength and force and now to this third generation i'm see we're seeing the mediocrities the committee men the uh, buggins turn people rise into the top some people who've not served in parish ministry so to speak yes absolutely um but and so it is and now we're seeing the church for the sake of a uh, diocese for the sake of others uh shedding uh, some parishes who have disowned, all of a sudden discovered that they're woke. Well, who was my, and this is what, this is the process in the Episcopal Church. It wasn't all of a sudden somebody woke up woke one day. It's just that they came in, always were this way, and then reached a point where they could actually move and put their things in action. You know, the stealth people moving in. Who is guarding the gates of the ACNA? Who is guarding the gates of the clergy training? Mm -hmm. um, the well, what, one of the biggest complaints I've heard from the the House of Bishops, the, the Synod of Bishops, College of Bishops in the uh, ACNA is there were many unfettered priests allowed in uh, mm -hmm. through C4SO. And I don't know if that's going to continue. Um, and that would be a big worry. You don't want to uh, let one diocese bring down your church. You don't want to um, allow that uh, a single diocese to have too much influence. You know, you're you're but, a body of many dioceses. But see, Kevin, that's what happened. That was the path that the Episcopal Church took when nine out of ten bishops thought Jack Spong was a nut job and his theology was wrong. But you know. We really don't want to go to the public expense of shaming him and disfellowshipping him and all this and that. We're now in a position in the ACNA where nine out of ten bishops say what the critical race theory stuff uh, and uh, other things that is being pushed by C4SO. We think it's wrong, but we're really not going to crack down on the leader who's allowing it to happen. Well, I do see that there is accountability. Is it 1978 in the ACNA? Okay. <laughs> no, I don't think so, because we see so many bishops being held accountable. We have two bishops coming up on trial uh, in the near future for um, uh, stepping outside the canons of the church. And yeah, but that's that's more for sex and uh, for being... Um, power. Sex and power, mm -hmm. not uh, not doctrine. 
uh, unless unless sex is a doctrine for some people, as <laughs> I don't think it is. But, uh, so I don't mean to be dismissive or said because, because you know the, the Holy Spirit does have a way of opening doors when doors are closing. Are we seeing the start of a new? Are we seeing the start of where we conservative uh, Episcopalians, Anglicans, the Global Methodists, the North American Lutheran Church? Are we seeing a way forward where all of us can put aside 400 years of denominational stressing of purity to be a common witness and focus for our risen Lord Jesus Christ and speak with common voice and mind and ministry? Is this finally going to happen? Which is my devoutest hope, that we can all get together across the... and not only across the Reformation, not across the post-Reformation divide, but Frankly, we have more. I have more in common with a traditional Catholic than I do with a liberal Catholic, who has more in common with the Episcopal Church. Pope Francis certainly and would be much more at home in the diocese of uh, New Jersey, of, uh, New Jersey or Newark, <laughs> than he would be in Central Florida. Yeah, but, is God moving us that way? I don't know the answer, but I hope. I hope so. Well, my prayer is that God is always willowing the church and always willowing the leaders in the church. But Ronald Reagan said we're always one gen freedom is one generation from extinction. And in the Episcopal Church, or the church as a whole, we're always one generation from being persecuted for our faith in the church. Mm -hmm. And right now, the Episcopal Church is persecuting its Christians. Uh, the uh, Anglican Church in Canada is persecuting its Christians. The Church of Wales, uh, the Church of England, you just, they're persecuting its Christians. And a generation ago, that was not so. Yeah. And the knock-on effect of this is that when we in the United States are playing these stupid games, how can we stand beside our brothers in China or in Pakistan or in the Sudan when they are, fear, you know, when they are seeing state persecution uh, st or or the th like we reported about the priest who was approached last week in pakistan recite the shahada and instead he recited the nicene creed and he was shot in the streets we're not facing that in the united states yeah we may have well but we may have some transgendered nut job yell at us mm -hmm. spit at us uh you uh see that in some protests that uh, break into the civilized parts of San Francisco and Portland right now. Yeah, I mean, if you go on YouTube, you'll see uh, violence against priests in Brazil. Uh, the, the, there's a women's movement down there uh, that has just taken off. Uh, and it's very violent towards uh, the clergy. Uh, and it, I come back yeah, years ago, Kevin, if, if I heard myself saying these sort of words, I wouldn't think I'd lost the plot, but I do believe in the demonic and the satanic. I do believe that Satan is at work in the world. I believe Satan is a real person, is a real thing, not just a disembodied entity, not just a disembodied ideal. Mm -hmm. And I believe that evil is really ramping up in the world in which we live. And what is good is now being called evil, and what is evil is being lauded as good by the world and the culture. Amen. Why do I believe the devil's real? Jesus met him. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger. And you've been watching episode 821 of Anglican Unscripted.